an animated stairway appears descending in pyramid shape to the words higher ground. Animated autumn leaves blow away, revealing a wheelchair. Rusted Spoke Productions. A portable videotape recorder. I'm recording now. I want to shut it off. I got to press the trigger again. And she'll start rolling again. Two teenage yeah. boys with a microphone. Would you like to see um, handicapped people depicted as people? Excuse me? A young man uses upper body and arm strength to transfer from a wheelchair to a sound engineer's seat. Jim Lebrecht is a sound designer at the Berkeley Repertory Theater in California. He was born with a disability which has nothing to do with his job. But having the job makes it possible for him to lead an independent, productive life. He scales a ladder to a loft above the stage to operate an overhead mic. As a joyful child, he easily hauls himself to the top of a dresser. Middle-aged Jim recounts. I was born with spina bifida. They didn't think I was going to live more than a couple of hours. Apparently, I had different plans. In home movie footage, toddler-aged Jim crawls downstairs headfirst. He uses a long-handled stick to turn on a light switch, then collects a cup of water from a bathtub faucet and drinks it. Next, a yellow school bus travels down a street. In the middle of first grade, I was allowed to enter public school on a trial basis. A class field trip in his wheelchair. They were going to see if it worked out. He wheels himself into a building. I mean, at the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. He drives a toy car. I remember that my dad used to say to me, you know, Jimmy, you're going to have to be really outgoing. You're going to have to go up and introduce yourself to people because they're not going to come up to you. He rides his wheelchair in a parade. My sister Lindsay was a brownie, but they wouldn't let me into the Cub Scouts. The barriers were all over the place. As a preteen, he slides into a pool from the diving board. I loved music. I loved life. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. View of a field with cabins and lush mountains in the background. And then I hear from some people about the summer camp. It's a summer camp for, you know, the handicapped run by hippies. And somebody said, you know, you probably will smoke dope with the counselors. And I'm like, sign me up. Teenage Jim wheels down a ramp amid shaggy looking youths in a communal hippie atmosphere. The wild thing is, is that this camp changed the world. And nobody knows this story. There's something happening here. But what it is ain't exactly clear. Opening titles appear over scenes There's of disabled participants at Camp Jeanette there. and protests around Handicapped Rights me, Section 504, a Netflix where. original documentary. I think it's time we stop, children. What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. A collage of images shows disabled and non-disabled young people of different ethnicities and descriptions. Family photos are followed by images of young people at camp laughing and horsing around. Black and white footage of a Camp Jeanette t-shirt and people riding a Ferris wheel. Graphic of a wheelchair with a red fist above the wheel. Protesters sign and chant. A placard reads, Handicapped Revolution. From behind, we stop What's that sound? Everybody look what's going now. Stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody A higher ground and rusted spoke production in association with Little Punk, Just Films, and the Ford Foundation. Executive producers include Barack and Michelle Obama. Written and directed by Nicole Noonan and Jim Lebrecht. Title Crip Camp. Now, present-day Jim narrates over scenes of a bus traveling through rural countryside in 1971. So I remember the first time I went to Camp Jeanette. We take this bus trip from Manhattan up to the Catskills. It's about a three-hour drive. And you get into this really lovely kind of mountainous areas, and you could smell, like, the hot land and the pines, and you're hearing birds and stuff. And then we pull into the parking lot, and these people start swarming around the bus. The place has got a bunch of hippies in it, and some of them look pretty freaky. And it's like, wow, I'm not sure who's a camper and who's a counselor. Past participants recount. First, African-American camp counselor, Lionel J. Woodyard, now a senior citizen. I grew up in Mobile, Alabama. I saw a sign that said, summer jobs, camps, New York. I didn't know anyone handicapped. 
I was feeling a little anxious about the kids. Counselor Joe O'Connor. I had zero experience with disabled people. I knew as many disabled people as I knew sumo wrestlers. So I'm at the front of the bus, and I was not prepared for the visual of so many disabled people at one time. And I froze. I became paralyzed with fear. Then somebody behind me pushed me because I was in the way, and that forward momentum carried me through the summer. Able-bodied young people, both black and white, carry disabled youths of all descriptions off the bus. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Richie Havens performs at Woodstock. Like a mother, Past camper and Capolo Freeman. I mean, when Woodstock was happening, I remember being at my grandmother's listening on the transistor radio and saying, wish I could go, wish I could go, wish I could go. And then when I went to Janine, it was like, there I was, I was in Woodstock. The music and the people. And just feel like these people are crazy, you know? I mean, in a good way. A girl at camp. Come to Camp Jeanette and find yourself. You know? <laughs> a boy slides out of his wheelchair into a pool. Then he dives underwater amid other swimmers and those floating in life jackets. Past camper Denise Jacobson recounts. Subtitles read, It was so funky, but it was a utopia. When we were there, there was no outside world. A black and white camp photo shows Denise as an 18-year-old beaming at the camera from her wheelchair. Playing baseball, a camper scurries excitedly toward first base. Next, counselors lift campers with life jackets on into a boat. Then they go for a row on a lake. At night, musicians perform and everyone dances jubilantly, on foot, on the floor, and in wheelchairs. A boy in a tie-dye t-shirt smiles ecstatically as he rocks and gyrates in his wheelchair. Black and white cam footage shows Jimmy Lebrecht at age 15 with a mop of fair curly hair. He wheels around the bustling camp with an interviewer. If you want to stop and look at anything with the camera, you tell us you can do that. All right, there's the adult part. Wheeling along a path. What's that yellow building there? That's what I just said, the, uh, the adult part right there. Well, that's part of the adult camp. Yeah. A smiling black woman skirts around them. Gorgeous counselors. <laughs> Say hello. Hi, how are you? OK. <laughs> A cabin with laundry on the railing. Here is uh, Girls One. Place for fun and frolic. <laughs> There's one of the campers, Valerie Valvona. Jimmy! Smiling Valerie walks supported by two crutches. Is this necessary? I mean, is this important? Oh, my God. A bearded, shirtless man is digging near the pool. Is that a director over there? Larry Allison. <laughs> Understand you're the director here? Yeah, I bought the, the director of the camp, but uh, I uh, I was uh, just out here by the uh, swimming pool uh, watching the uh, kids swim. And I decided to dig a few holes because uh, they're kind of kids are kind of clumsy, and I thought it'd be funny if they tripped. Jim is subtitled. <laughs> Teach us cripples a lesson. <laughs> That's right. Larry narrates over historical camp scenes. Jeanette was an opportunity to try to do some different kinds of things. When the camp started back in the 50s, it was the uh, traditional kind of camp program. As it evolved during the 60s and into the 70s, what we tried to do was provide a kind of environment where teenagers could be teenagers without all the stereotypes and the labels and that was a byproduct of the times, you know, of social experimentation. Larry gently positions a young man in a wheelchair. We realized the problem did not exist with people with disabilities. The problem existed with people that didn't have disabilities. It was our problem. So it was important for us 
to change. An elderly camper. Just the same. I like Ken Jeanette. And I love Larry Olson. Olson. She kisses his cheek. Ellison. He hugs her. Good for you, Sophie. <laughs> Several campers gather for the interviewer. My name is Elliot Brashkin. A heavy set young woman with short hair. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brooklyn. A young woman with long, fair hair. Hello, my name is Jean Malafront. I uh, got run over by a bus. Someone says, Congratulations. <laughs> I don't know exactly my handicap, yeah. and that's all. A tall young man. My name is Carl, and if this is ever broadcast on television, my telephone number is area code 212, <laughs> 0367, and I would love anyone who likes to talk to give me a telephone call, and I am blind and hard of hearing. I had too much oxygen in the incubator, And I would, and my hearing because I had a fractured skull from falling out of a cab. And I would be glad if anyone will call me who hears this. Jim and the interviewer visit another cabin. This is where I stay. On the porch, they approach a young man in a wheelchair with shaggy brown hair. Steve's a Can I take a picture of this cat? Smile, Steve. Counselor Steve Hoffman, age 20, smiles from his wheelchair as the camera view bounces shakily from person to person. It's been a pleasure, Steve Hoffman. Steve, subtitles. Wow. Thank you. Don't make me, Don't get, make me get a fat head. They wheel inside a messy cabin. Enough to light to roll up inside and see what it looks like? Uh, I don't know. Steve. The bunk is a mess. But we like it like that. Yeah. Hey, Tommy. Yeah. This is Tommy Curran. Hi, Tommy. Tommy Curran waves with both hands. Nobody uses those yeah. upper beds, right? Yeah. What? The upper beds? The counselors do. The counselors do. A young man counselor is napping. <laughs> Subtitle. <laughs> pets the usual state of the counselors. <laughs> Preteen clean cut Jim pets a dog and cat curled up together. Mm, that first night in the bunk, I was a little bit nervous. Present day Jim recounts. I had just had surgery. Up to that point, I was wearing diapers. So I had no control over my bladder. I guess you could imagine what it was like being 15. And trying to hide the fact that you had to wear diapers. And there was that constant pressure of being found out. I had gotten this urinary tract diversion, so now I had this bag. It wasn't going too well. I was having a hard time kind of keeping it on, and, and it was leaking and such. But at camp, everybody had something going on with their body, it just wasn't a big deal. Long haired boys in wheelchairs interview each other. Okay, okay uh, my first guest, what's your name? My name is Michael Tannenbaum.、Uh, how old are you? I, I was just 18. <laughs>、um, what do you think is the most significant part about Camp、uh, Jeanette?、Uh, the staff, how great they are, how good they relate to the campus. Are you lying? <laughs> no, I'm not lying. <laughs> It's just that I've been in other camps, and、yeah. no other camp have campus treated. Have counselors treated the campus the way they do here. They're not like babysitters. <laughs> That was a good answer. <laughs> Thank you, John. 23 year old counselor Judy Human in her wheelchair. It's not 100% sure, but since the new trip is going to be coming up Thursday, what we are going to try to do is get the cook to take off Wednesday, which means that we'll cook on Wednesday. Do you have any,、um, any suggestions? I, I was trying to see if we could make veal parmesan, but veal is too expensive. What do you think of lasagna? Try it. How many people? Raise your hands. How many people want lasagna? Several hands go up. Hey, Judy, the next day, the only day we get not to eat starch. You don't have to eat those starchy things. The white lasagna. How many people don't want lasagna? A few hands go up. Lasagna. 
Lasagna win. All right. When you go back into Mark, when you go back into your groups, will you also decide get some suggestions as to what you want and when we come back in a group together, um, we'll decide what we're gonna have to eat. Okay, if the cookie's off on Wednesday. Middle-aged Judy recounts. I felt like it was important to be inclusive because I didn't really have a lot of role models. As I was growing up who had disabilities, it made people feel like they were more a part of what was happening. It was more free and open than certainly what I was experiencing in my day-to-day -day life at home. Scenes of a young family in a 1953 urban neighborhood. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in a neighborhood called East Flatbush. A dad playfully lifts a toddler. Growing up in the neighborhood, I didn't feel different. I had polio. I wasn't able to walk anymore and things like that, but there were a lot of kids we played outside stick ball and jump rope, and it was a great neighborhood. So one day I was going to the candy store with a group of friends. My friend was pushing my wheelchair, and we went around the block, and this kids came over, this one boy said, are you sick? And I was really, like, taken aback, and I recall that I meekishly said, no, I'm not sick but I remember I wanted to cry. I get that feeling a lot, even as an adult. I'm kind of in between being shocked by the question, maybe being angry by it, but like having to center myself. It was an awakening that people saw me not as Judy, but as somebody who was sick. A photo of smiling little girl Judy in leg braces. When I was five years old, my mother took me to the local school to enroll me. But the principal said I couldn't go to that school because I couldn't walk, I could be a fire hazard. So basically, my mother was teaching me. Other kids ride in a school bus. Of course, all my friends in the neighborhood were going to school, but I was at home. Then one day when I was about eight, nine years old, my mom got a call that there was an opening in PS219 in the special ed classes. The school bell rings and able-bodied children file in. The classes for disabled kids were in the basement. The other classes were upstairs. We would call the non-disabled kids upstairs, kids. They would come down, a few of them. Fridays help us go to assembly. They were allowed to come and, you know, meet us in our classroom and push our wheelchairs. Photos of disabled school children. There were people that I met in those classes who then went to Camp Chenet together. Neil Jacobson, Stevie Hoffman, and Nancy Rosenblum. We would sit together at lunch and I would help people, you know, put their sandwich in their sandwich holder. And I think we respected each other and we all felt that what we were saying was important. I mean, in some way, even when we were that young, we knew that we were all being sidelined. We what? <laughs> we didn't want to sideline anybody. We wanted to hear what everybody had to say. We were willing to listen. At Jeanette, campers in a circle listen to fellow camper Nancy Rosenblum. <laughs> I can't do it. I think you're really great. I, in the bunk, when the worst things happen, you'll just be sitting in the corner cracking up and nobody can get depressed when you're sitting there. <laughs> so she knows what she's doing when she's all that quiet. No, I really dig you, Nancy. And there are a lot of things, you know, I'd like to get to know you better, but so far as I know you, I really like you. Subtitle. She's very nice, very nice, and... Remember, you're speaking to her, not about her. I don't know too much about you, but you're okay. 
A view of a dog on the path at camp, then campers, many being pushed in wheelchairs, gather in the dining hall. Judy addresses the group. Um, there's some people here who have been filming. I told them that I, I would like them to please address us as a group so they could tell us their ideas and we could ask any questions that we wanted to. We are the People's Video Theater. It's Ken Marsh. I'm Howie Gutstadt, and that's Ben Levine over there. And we have been working with this equipment, which is half-inch videotape, which is simply closed system television. Whatever actually you really want to say about yourselves, let us know. Let's have a lot of interaction. Campers joke around while watching themselves on a video monitor. Others draw Tommy's attention to the monitor. A teen with glasses in a wheelchair who laughs and wags his head. Others make the peace sign, point, and gesture. One girl curls her hand around gracefully. Out in a field, campers with limited agility lob a baseball around. Jim recounts. There was a period of adjustment I had to go through for the first couple of weeks of camp. Teenage Jim cruises past the baseball field in his wheelchair. Because I was in public school, I wasn't around other people with disabilities. I wasn't a shut-in. I could come and go more or less as I pleased. And not everybody at the camp had those advantages. Some of them were going to special schools. Some of them were isolated a lot of the time. You had people from institutions. Campers play guitar and sing. Being 15, I was drawn to the people that were smoking cigarettes and listening to music. Outside of camp, I really didn't feel like a cool kid. But at Jeanette, I was. You know, I, there were a lot of cute girls at camp. And, you know, I, I was friendly. As a camper, Jim blows a kiss to a girl in a wheelchair with long brown hair and dark eyes. Subtitles, Denise. At home. At home. Some people, some people had a hierarchy of disability. The polios were on top. Because they looked more normal. And the CPs were at the bottom. CP meaning cerebral palsy. But at Jeanette, you were just, you were just a kid. A kid. We, we met we went when we went to Jeanette. But he's younger than I am. Denise's husband, Neil Jacobson. When we decided to get married, my mom said to me, I understand why you want to marry a handicapped girl. But why can't you find a polio? Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Teenage Jim continues his tour of the grounds. A bench is nestled at the forest edge. A sitting corner over there. It's kind of dark over here. So what does that mean? What goes on there? Subtitles. A little nookie. You've been going around giving me this very superficial tour. Let's have some real stuff. That's where he and Nancy nice go one. off, and... Well, who's Nancy? It's my girl. Young Jim cuddles up with the brown-haired girl, Nancy D'Angelo, age 17. They smile and wave to the camera. Adult Jim recounts. Camp Jeanette was where I met my first girlfriend, Nancy. 
She was funny, she was cute, she was always in the middle of things and having a really, really great time. I mean, I really loved her. As much as you can at the age of 15, you know? I literally remember us, like, making out in the dining hall. It seemed like we were making out all the time. Judy recounts. There was a romance in the air, if you wanted to experience it. I never dated outside of camp. But at Jeanette, you could have makeout sessions behind the bunks and different places like that. Neil. The, big year the first year I was at camp, camp. One, of the women one of the women counselors gave me a whole a lesson whole on how to kiss. That was one of the best physical therapies I ever had. <laughs> a couple days after that, I had my first date with a girl, with a girl camper. And I felt her hand on my cock. That was heaven. A snapshot of teenage Neil at camp, arms spread, beaming. Then a couple of girls ride on the hood of a car as it slowly drives across the campus with four smiling occupants. They pass clothes hanging on a fence and bedding spread out on the grass. Nancy D'Angelo. What, you want me to tell them what happened? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> well, two people got cramps and um, they're spreading. They form a human body in there. And, oh, no. And they, um, they uh, multiply. Judy. In the beginning, when this thing started happening last night, we found out what was going on. We were kind of all very hyper about it. And who the fuck knew what, you know? crabs were or lice or anything. Jim. Go over there. What's over there? <laughs> My girl. <laughs> Have you seen her today? Just from over here. Have you talked to her? Not really, just from across here. We're all quarantined. I mean, it's our, first, it's our first week anniversary today. <laughs> it's your first weekend anniversary and you can't even talk to her. That's right. Why, I'm mad? Nancy. Oh, yeah. I'm mad because I can't see Jimmy. Today is our first week anniversary. <laughs> I got those poor old crab blues, yeah. Larry. I haven't had so much fun since Grandma caught her tit in the ring gun. We're thinking of collecting all the crabs and having a bake. We may have to burn the bastards out. With ponytail and glasses, wheelchair user Al Levy. This is the most asinine stupid that I've ever heard. When thinking about it rationally, I realized that I don't itch. There's no need for me to disinfect, and my wheelchair doesn't itch. And neither does my bed, my mattress, or my, my uh, roommate Bruce. Yet we're all in the process of dehumanization. In a match. Gene. We got crab power! What do we do? And it's the best activity yet! I do so declare, y'all. Tell him, Gene. It's incredible! Al. You know, uh, how would you like to have somebody wash your balls? He pauses while the interviewer lights his cigarette. Right, I can do it myself for me. So, you know, I don't really care. But there are other people who can, you know, and they have to have it done for them. You know, people around here feel small enough most of the time. And uh, when somebody has to scrub their balls, they'll probably feel even smaller. Judy. I think actually what happened out of it is that people were having fun. We were working together um, as a whole unit, washing and cleaning and showering and doing things that we've never done before. And it's, it's really a very different kind of a thing. And I have to go shower some people. I'll see you later. Adult Judy recounts. At Camp Jeanette, personal assistance was built into all of our lives who needed help. At the poolside, a man carries a boy to his wheelchair. There were people there that would Help me get dressed and undress and go to the bathroom and shower and get in and out of the pool. Counselors help a girl in a life jacket step into the pool, then she floats on her back with one at her side. In some way, was also the beginning of my experiencing what it would be like to have someone other than my mother or my father have to do all those things. With help, campers play with soccer balls, crawling and shimmying across the grass. Lionel. At the camp, you could do anything that you thought you wanted to try to do. You wouldn't be picked to be on a team back home. But at Jeanette, you had to go up to bat. Counselors help baseball players in wheelchairs. 
And if you didn't hit the ball, hell, you were out. Young Lionel runs, pushing players around the bases in wheelchairs, tipped back for speed. A sign reads, Lake George, 32 miles long. Lionel recounts. When we were at Jeanette, the Disability Act had not been passed. So when we would take the campus on a trip in the town for ice cream, we couldn't get you in the door. And then deal with the staring, a deal with, we don't want them here because it made our other customers feel uncomfortable. Whatever obstacles that were in my way, being a black man, the same thing was held true for individuals in wheelchairs. Back home, I had to be careful who I said things to because that was a way of surviving. That were survival skills that you had. I had to be very, very, very careful not to be disrespectful, not to look a white man in his eye. You had to do those things. You had to be mindful of that. A boy with dark, shaggy hair kneels on the ground. He drums on a metal chair and sings. Standing hits a tambourine. Jim leads a roundtable discussion. Are you, are you ready? Yeah. All right. We're here now. We're going to talk about parents, you know, and what kind of, how they bug us or how you like them, whatever it is. Maybe we should start off with uh, overprotectiveness, which I really hate. Does anybody want to start off? My parents are great, but sometimes I hate them because they're too great and they're too protective of me and things that I want to do and I would love to do, they say, no, you can't do it, you're handicapped. And they keep reminding me of the fact that I'm in a chair. And they don't seem to realize that there's so much I could do. Subtitles. I think generally, I think generally a parent is afraid to show that their son is disabled or handicapped or whatever you might call it. And um, I, think, I think it's much more out of fear than of overprotectiveness. Jim. I depend on my mother for some things. And so I, I can't really fight her as hard as I wish I could. What kind of things do you depend on? Well, I should, some of the things like just everybody else depends their parents for like laundry and stuff. But like, like she's the person that orders special supplies when I'll need it and stuff. And if I'm in a position where I'm not able to do something, you know, like, she's going to have to do it. And so, like, if you keep on bucking your mother saying, you know, fire constantly, then there's going to be a time when she's going to be very reluctant. Nancy D'Angelo. Um, everybody thinks, everybody think that their parents are, you know, stricter with us, or, you know, do they hate us the same as your sister or brother, or do they think you have to be careful? I have no. two brothers. And um, they got a lot more freedom than I did. There goes your argument, those are brothers. Basically, That's a universal argument. We're basically brothers around the same age. It's her responsibility oh. to do that, and as long as she keeps on accepting things being done for her, it'll always be done. Steve. I'm really bothered by that comment. Nancy Rosenblum. She smiles at the interviewer as he brings the microphone closer.
someone on the phone? Wait a minute, get part of it? Steve. I think Nancy is talking about what everybody wants to be alone sometimes in their life. Like to think alone and to be alone. And I think Nancy is saying that she's been denied the right of privacy. Is that? Nancy. Yeah, that's true. I think that's one of the major right gathered on a porch the discussion group sits in wheelchairs around a table littered with cups and dirty dishes adult jim recounts what we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better the fact of the matter is you don't have anything to strive for if you don't know that it exists judy recounts we kept having these discussions it was allowing us to recognize we needed to look at ways of doing things together, not just at camp, but after camp. I can't see my reflection in the water. I can't speak the sounds to show no pain. Jim. When it was time to leave camp, some of us vowed to stay in touch and write or call. I'll remember the sounds of my own name. There was always the chance that some campers weren't going to come back next year. Campers entertain each other with song and dance routines. Shelley recounts. The night before the end of camp, everybody would be hanging out almost all night. Nobody wanted to go to bed. Lionel recounts. It was a very happy night, but you knew the next morning that would be tears. was not a crooked tree. If tomorrow was in such a long time. Lionel. We were going back, almost in time. Lonesome would mean nothing to you at all. Joe. We were brothers and sisters there. Counselors wheel campers to the waiting bus and move luggage in a truck bed, then the bus travels on an urban highway. Next, as adult Lionel recounts, photos appear of him interacting with campers and counselors from Jeanette. I took ideas back home that my community was unfamiliar with. I wore tie-dye shirts. My afro had grown really, really, it was out like this. I burned incense. Between the revolution that was going on, the peace movement, the desire to stop the war, I became very involved in that. Jeanette had exposed me to the world outside of Alabama. Jim recounts. At camp, I was in a whole other world. My first girlfriend, and I'm popular, and I'm... And I'm going back to this world in which it's hard to get around. Sometimes I would just, like, go home after high school and go to bed for a few hours and just get away from the world. I have friends, but I'm the only person with a disability. Yearbook photo front and center in his wheelchair. I had to try to adapt. I had to fit into this world that wasn't built for me. It never dawned on me that the world was ever going to change. 1972 Manhattan, a woman cannot access the subway in her wheelchair. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public uh, transportation because it discriminates against the disabled due to the fact that it's architecturally inaccessible. Man in a wheelchair, subtitle. Those are steps. Stay on, the Stay on the street and go around the block. Wearing a suit, he wheels through traffic on a busy street. 70s era PBS TV show. Most animal species abandon or destroy members of the group which are maimed or deformed. Some human societies have been equally harsh. Down through the centuries, our literature, and recently our movies, are full of monstrous, misunderstood creatures. Through this conditioning, we come to think of the handicapped as objects of fear or pity or loathing. Tonight, we look at them as human beings, 
with problems. Young Judy is transported in a delivery truck with a lift. Next, a discussion group of young people with different disabilities. Judy Human is the president of Disabled in Action, a political organization of the handicapped. I think one of the real problems is, is that when you grow up being disabled, um, it's, it's the fact that you're not considered either a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And even the, the, the beginning of any kind of a relationship, you know, beginning at all, because you're just thought of as a disabled person, you know, Sexual. person being sec yeah, second and right. asexual, and can you do this and can you Pat Figueroa, Jeanette counselor and activist. Operator in school, that whenever he, he, he stops on the floor, and there are a couple of wheelchairs, uh, people in wheelchairs waiting, he, 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 he starts yelling, all right, get these wheelchairs in here, get these wheelchairs in here. And he doesn't take into consideration the people in, you know, the, 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 the person, you know, the person the there. You know, it's just wheelchairs to him. Judy. I don't think I felt really shame about my disability. What I felt more was exclusion. For me, the camp experience really was empowering because we helped empower each other that the status quo is not what it needed to be. Disabled in Action was started as a result of a lawsuit that I had brought against the Board of Education in New York City. There was publicity going on and we set up all these different committees. One of the first things that Disabled in Action worked on was on deinstitutionalization. Eyewitness News Report, Willowbrook, The Last Great Disgrace. There are some aspects of life which society has hidden from public view. The following program will remind you that they exist and that we all bear a responsibility to humanity. Jim. I remember watching TV one evening before dinner and on comes this expose about this state hospital in New York called Willowbrook. The early morning mist gave the place an eerie feeling like a set from a horror movie. And once inside, that feeling became suddenly appropriate. Geraldo Rivera. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 severely and profoundly retarded children. Lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces, they were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. It was really shocking. It was just like, how could this be? Children are fed mush. The kids can't feed themselves. Uh, there are so few attendants that there's only an average, it's been timed, three minutes per child for feeding. How much time would be needed to do a job adequately? The same amount of time that your children or my children would want to have to eat breakfast. Jim. I suddenly remembered one summer, there had been a camper at Camp Jeanette from Willowbrook. I remember being in the dining hall and this guy comes in. He was basically just eating as much as he could. He was just kept on shoveling it in until the point where he threw up. It was kind of like somebody coming in from the wild. Geraldo reports from Willowbrook. What's the consequence of three minutes per meal per child? The consequence is death from pneumonia. Judy. I had never seeing the inside of an institution like this. Emaciated children piled in wooden carts. The chaos that existed was frightening to me because I recognized that myself and other friends could have easily been in this institution. Half-dressed adults with cuts and bruises sit unattended. At the time, people still were not thinking of what was wrong with the Willowbrooks of the country the civil rights movement was going on around us, and that was an opportunity to talk about why were we excluded and what did we need to do. There weren't anti-discrimination laws at the federal level, but members in the Senate and House were looking for avenues to make that happen. The Rehabilitation Act in 1972 was a perfect vehicle. Buried at the end of the bill was Section 504, an anti-discrimination provision. The language was drawn from civil rights legislation in the 1960s. It was gonna mean that anybody who got federal money, hospitals, education, transportation, on and on, was gonna to have to not discriminate. It was like a Yahoo wonderful moment and Nixon vetoed it. News report. The president has vetoed a bill setting up a vocational rehabilitation program because he said it would cost too much. 
uh, would be just impossible in terms of its financial cost to put in elevators or ramps and all of these stations. Just costs would be horrendous uh, in terms of their total. The problem here is... William Ronan, NYC Transit Authority. Question, how many people would really be served by it? Scenes of 1970s New York City. Billboards, shops, traffic, pedestrians. Judy. The Sable Live Action decided to have a demonstration in New York City in front of Nixon headquarters. Film strips show people with different disabilities gathering. We decided that we were going to sit down in the street. We were going to stop traffic. So at 4.30 in the afternoon, we formed this huge circle. We cut off four streets. And recounts. You get the call to action, to the barricades. You know, Judy would call it. I remember being on the ground with these big trucks coming at you, going, whoa. Former Willowbrook doctor William Bronston. It was a very unusual demonstration. I mean, people are not used to seeing a whole lot of folks in wheelchairs. And you had to back up. I mean, you had to back up if you were on the wrong side in front of that young woman. Photos of Judy protesting, then a news helicopter circles the city. This is WYN. They were announcing paraplegic stop traffic in Manhattan. Photos show traffic gridlock, Judy recounts. There were only 50 of us, but basically, with the one street, we were able to shut the city down. Photos of the roadblock, people in wheelchairs and on crutches, a blind man with a guide dog, Dr. William Bronston recounts. Those DIA demonstrations were the first time a real serious, radical agenda was mobilized. Photographs, teenage Jim in his bedroom, Judy crossing a New York street in her wheelchair, disabled protesters rally. When I heard about DIA, I really wanted to join. But I often couldn't go because I was stuck in high school. Judy would put out the call that we're going to show up to this event and we're going to demonstrate about this or that. And when this call came out to go to this Martin Luther King birthday gathering, I had to go. News photo of the King family at his grave. So I took the train down from Hartsdale to Grand Central Station. And going to Grand Central Station, it's so freaking huge. That day, I couldn't find a ramp or an elevator. 70s footage of crowded Grand Central and subway stairs leading to the street. And I had to climb out of my chair, pull the wheelchair up behind me. So step by step, pull it up, push my, put myself up, pull it up, push myself up. But I made it. And I was there with Pat Figueroa, one of the counselors from Camp Jeanette. A long trail of disabled people passes the Washington Monument. In the spring of 1973, we decided we were going to have another demonstration. The bottom line was we were a small group of disabled people. We were getting very little coverage from the media at the national level because we didn't have any disabled veterans. And that was, you know, the time of the Vietnam War. Disabled veterans arrive with able-bodied supporters. A man's wheelchair is framed with a Stop Vietnam War placard. Policemen wear riot gear at the Lincoln Monument with Judy. Vietnam Veterans Against the War spokesman Bobby Muller. They lied about the war in Vietnam. They've lied about every damn thing in the world. They lied about Watergate, and they're lying about how they're treating us. They're lying about how they're treating the physically disabled and mentally retarded in this country. We wanted to be able to mobilize disabled individuals in D.C. to express the feelings of the disabled community around the United States and that in unity we do have strength and that we must expand the pie that we're fighting from so that we don't have to fight each other, but that we can all get our adequate services. That's really what this is getting into. News coverage as disabled people and supporters pass by with placards. There is a minority in America that has only recently begun to speak up and be heard. They face problems of discrimination and prejudice in employment, education, transportation, and in just about every other aspect of what society considers everyday life. Until the last few years, they suffered mostly in silence, but that's changing. They have begun to organize and to get politically active. Amid the protesters, Neil, Denise, and Nancy D'Angelo are seen wheeling past. Eventually, Nixon caved into all the political pressure, and he signs the rehab bill. But they do nothing to enforce Section 504. Photo of Nixon signing. Then a photo of college-aged Denise. Denise recounts. I had graduated, I had graduated college, college and, went back and went back to live at home. At home. 
in the Bronx. I was I was very isolated. I was I was homesick for Jeanette. I had to take a I had to take a bold step. I was an intern at United Cerebral Palsy and I had an affair with the bus driver because you know, I wasn't getting any younger. And I didn't want to die a virgin. One night, I had this horrible abdominal pain. A surgeon decided it had to be appendicitis. They operated and took out a regular appendix. My doctor came in and he gave me a pelvic and said, you know, I think you might have gonorrhea. And for one brief moment, I was so proud of myself. But then, when I thought about it, it was all because the surgeon decided how could I be sexually active? I mean, look at me. Who would wanna who would wanna fuck with me? And so I and so I decided to go back to school and got a master's in human sexuality. And that was my ticket out of the box. College-age Denise grins wearing a t-shirt that reads Behind this t-shirt lies a sensuous woman. Next, footage of 1970s cars on a highway. Jim recounts. In 1974, I finally graduated high school. I wound up going to UC San Diego, 3,000 miles away. Photo of college-age Jim on top of a station wagon tying down luggage. My plan was that I was going to study acoustics so I could do sound for the Grateful Dead. When I got to California, my whole life opened up. I wanted to take advantage of everything. Snapshots of Jim and able-bodied college friends on beaches and trails. I tried to learn how to surf. One night, I even convinced my friend Doug I could drive his motorcycle. As absurd as it sounds, I really felt like I had overcome my disability. During my first year in college, I heard that a bunch of people from Camp Jeanette had moved out to Berkeley. Young people dance on the Berkeley campus, blow bubbles, wear clown makeup, photo of Jim and friends grinning beside a van. I'd drive up and go to Dead concerts, and it seemed like I'd always bump into Al Levy. Al was like the deadhead. Al plays guitar in his wheelchair, surrounded by able-bodied hippie friends. The barrier was a wild scene. You didn't have to worry about fitting in like you did in San Diego. There was this whole movement brewing where a group of radical disabled people were like making this new world for themselves. 
A TV report shows a van equipped with a wheelchair lift and people with different disabilities in an office environment. The Center for Independent Living is unique because it is run by the handicapped for the handicapped. A model for the rest of the nation. A center where the severely disabled help themselves. Executive it's Director Ed Roberts. I think that a group of severely disabled individuals have really gotten together to solve some mutual problems. Judy. Ed Roberts contacted me to see if I'd be interested in coming out to Berkeley. I didn't want to go out there by myself. I said to D'Angelo, what do you think about moving out to Berkeley? And we were roommates. Photos of Nancy with a beer and smiling, then of Judy brushing teeth and cooking. Young Judy. I want to see a feisty group of disabled people all around the world. I mean, a group of people who um, will not accept no. Um, without asking why. That's really what's so critical about CIL is that, you know, it's not a card that you get handed at the door, but it is kind of a demand that is expected of people in this community. And that is, if you don't respect yourself and if you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not gonna get it. Writer and activist Corbett O'Toole. My first experience of finding hope was coming to Berkeley and hanging out at CIL. I had always kind of pretended like I wasn't disabled. You know, I could walk, I would stick the cane under the couch. But the whole time I'm worrying about the minute I have to get up and everybody's going to see me limp around. So I didn't realize how heavy that burden was until I was with people where I didn't have to pretend. TV report. The repair shop has just about everything, even electronic equipment to fine tune the battery powered wheelchair. And the center also provides transportation relying on state, local, and federal money. The goal is to make the handicap self-sufficient. Nancy answers an office phone. Nancy Dan's home to help you. She counsels a woman in a wheelchair. Um, let's see. It shouldn't be any problem finding you a tenant. What I'll do is I'll give you a list of people who want to work in the hours that you need somebody and their phone numbers, OK? Yeah. OK. And anything good. you need, we're here. Excuse okay. me. Judy. You want to live in a house, and that's your right. You want a two-bedroom apartment, we'll try to help you find a two-bedroom apartment. And here is how you can apply for money to get attendance paid for. Nancy Rosenblum, an so attendant. So do you want me to get anything while I'm out? <laughs> what? <laughs> Ice cream, what else? <laughs> and candy? Corbett. When that whole gang of the Camp Jeanette kids started to come, they were like this. Link like, so fingers. If you, if you socialize with one, like, oh, hey, you want to hang out on Friday night? Yes, but it always meant one of those people, if not five of those people, were always going to be there. You know, camp kind of traveled with them. There was like the traveling Camp Jen Ed show. And how did I first hear about it? Well, obviously, I heard about it from Steve, who was out here. Neil had the computer training program. Young Neil teaches a class. Senior Neil recounts subtitles. I came to California to go to grad school in computer science. Denise recounts subtitles. My first week in Berkeley, I got into a motorized chair for the first time in my life. It was very liberating. Young Denise smiles in her wheelchair at the beach. Next, risque Halloween costumes include Steve in a blonde wig and corset. Anne recounts. They took me to a Halloween party at CIL. I remember that day. It was, oh my God. They were all drunk and <laughs> carrying on. And, and these people, all these cripples, were dressed in costumes. And I don't know. I always felt you had to kind of hide yourself. He didn't want to draw attention. And there they were, like, all proud. It really struck me. Like, this is, this is different. This is really different. Mabu High Gardens Punk Club, San Francisco. Steve wheels onto a burlesque stage in a G-string. Next, we have Stephen Hoffman, 28. is a transvestite by trade. He likes to work with handicapped children and other animals. His ambition is to be a headless amoeba with a lot of large, thickly endowed boyfriends. Steve performs a kneeling striptease in his wig and corset. See, you met my faithful handyman. He's just a little boy. 
Steve at Jeanette. Subtitles. If you're, uh, in if you're a handicapped uh, person and you, at me, or have, uh, and you happen uh, to have a uh, passive nature uh, about you, uh, about you. Yeah. you're yeah, me, really me. screwed. On his knees, Steve whips off a bolero, then lies on his back to pull off stockings. He twists and dances on the floor in his G-string and wig. Next, 30-something Judy is interviewed on TV in 1977. Good evening, Judy. Good to see you again. How has the situation changed since 1973? Are you still as upset and angry as you were then? I think that what I've tried to do in part is to turn some of that anger around and, and put it into um, positive action. And outside of the fact that legislation has been passed, there's been very little actual enforcement. Protest at UN Plaza, San Francisco. Federal law prohibits discrimination against handicapped persons. An organization of the handicapped claims that law has been ignored. Today, there were demonstrations at 11 regional offices of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare across the nation. Judy recounts. Carter had been elected. They had said that the regulations would be adopted. But when Secretary Califano became head of Health, Education, and Welfare, he began to do a review. TV News. Handicapped citizens demonstrated at Health, Education, and Welfare today. They accused Secretary Califano of weakening and delaying regulations to implement the 1973 law to protect the rights of the handicapped. T.J. O'Rourke signing. We have maintained this position for almost three years now. But apparently when Mr. Califano became secretary, he said, a whole new ball game. To us, it is not. We're still in the same game. Spokesman, National Association of the Deaf. Now protesters wave placards and wear buttons saying, sign 504. <laughs> Joseph Califano, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, stands up on a tabletop. An interpreter signs his words for the audience. I have reviewed those regulations. There are some difficult questions. The last administration took two and a half years and decided not to move. I've had two and a half months. Why can't you move now? What are you waiting for? Because I want to make sure I understand them. His eyes scan the crowd. Then he eventually leaves the stage. Judy. What we were hearing is that lobbyists were coming in wanting to make changes in the regulations. Schools and universities and even hospitals didn't want to have to spend the money to make their buildings accessible. So we believe that there was like an imperative that we had to act quickly. Eunice we Fiorito. We were told today, you heard it here, that because of their failures, we are not to have our civil rights. She represents the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities. TV report. Some of the protesters vowed to stay outside of Califano's office until he signs the regulations. San Francisco. The coalition is a part of a national movement, and we're going to stick together and continue to fight for our civil rights. Wheelchair user, journalist Holland DeLille recounts. I didn't even know there was a national movement, and I didn't know what a 504 was. I was a girl from Texas when I was 22 just right out of college. And I was on my way home one day, and a truck ran me off the road. And so I became a paraplegic. I had all the assumptions and prejudices that people have about people with disabilities and about disabilities. And suddenly I was one. Photos show her caring for children in her wheelchair. I've never been around so many people with disabilities and so many different kinds of disabilities all in one place and all chanting about rights. Young Holland in her wheelchair sits at a typewriter. But I never really thought about it as applying to me. And I called Ms. Magazine and they gave me the assignment. 
So I went back there with my camera. Who are here in the Bay must stay together. We are the strongest political force in this country. We are young, we are sensitive, and we are intelligent. Blind African American activist Dennis Phillips recounts. I was asked to go to the demonstration by my sister, and I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And then all of a sudden, Someone said, well, let's go in the building. You know, what are we gonna do, stand outside? So I headed toward the building. Holland. The speeches were over, and I followed this group of people into the building. There must have been 300 people. And they went up to the fourth floor, and they went into the office of the regional director. Now, what's he gonna do with all these people in wheelchairs? Judy sits with Health, Education, and Welfare Regional Director Joseph Maldonado. We are not asking you anything unreasonable. We are asking you to request a telephone call to talk to Joseph Califano. Mr. Labasi, the general counsel for HEW, has been designated as a person that I should discuss these matters with. And if you care The more I sat in this room and got these absolutely non-answers, the angrier I got. And that's when people started really feeling like we couldn't leave because no one knew what we were talking about, but we knew that they were trying to rescind the regulation. Dennis recounts. Five or six o'clock came and nobody was leaving. So I figured, okay, we're we gonna have to spend the night. Photo of Judy <laughs> with protest wheelchair user Kitty Cone. Kitty and I and a few others, we just kind of took a vote and said, how many people want to stay overnight? And that's how it started. And recounts. You know, Judy said, bring a toothbrush. And I was like, okay. African-American protest leader and wheelchair user, Ron Washington. I said, well, Judy, I didn't come prepared. <laughs> she said, you, you got to stay here, Ron. You got to stay here. Disabled protesters are assembled inside. <laughs> Day one, Judy addresses the group. The objective for tonight, OK? people in the room cannot sleep on the floor. Bay Area was the most well organized. We had the expertise to not only have demonstrations, but to sustain them. Uh, 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 News report. So the sitting at San Francisco's HEW headquarters now is in its third day. Hot water has been turned off on the fourth floor, where the occupation army of cripples has taken over. Corbett. The FBI cut off the phones. Like they said, we couldn't have any communication. So we're like, OK, what do we do? And the deaf people went, we know what to do. Someone would sign out the window. That's how we communicated back and forth to the people outside the building. Protester. Uh, one fellow who's right behind me in his sleep right now built us a refrigerator. Uh, yeah, he, he attached some uh, plastic to uh, an air conditioner and uh, built it out of cardboard and stuff that was around. So we've been able to keep a lot of stuff cold. Dennis. There were just so many people trying to figure out how to eat, how to wash, where are we going to get food, where are we going to get blankets. Brad Lomax was the one who had the idea to call the Black Panthers. Brad could hardly speak, but he could gesture. <laughs> and he got his point across. Supplies are wheeled in, food is doled out. Corbett. The Panthers would bring a hot meal for dinner, and then they would leave food for breakfast and lunch. For nothing, no, no money, no nothing. I ended up, you know, after the meeting, I said to this guy, I said, I don't get it. You're the Black Panther Party, and you don't have a ton of resources. You know, they had a food kitchen in Oakland. Why are you choosing to feed us? He said to me, you know, you are trying to make the world a better place, and that's what we are about. We are about making the world a better place for everybody. So if you're going to go to the trouble to stay here and sleep on this floor, we're going to make sure you get fed. You know, that's how we survived. Protester. We have a cafeteria, we have a conference room, we have beds all over the place, mattresses, food. It's incredible. Judy recounts. Our support was much broader than just within the disability community. Union members and other civil rights organizations. We had relationships with local government. You know, the mayor was clearly in support. One of the secretaries in Sacramento sent down mattresses. Clyde Memorial Church, which was run by a progressive minister. We are a people who believe in liberation. Reverend Cecil Williams. It was the right place, the right time. Corbett. 
one of the women who ran the big lesbian bar in the East Bay came and said, what do you guys need? And we said, oh, we're so tired of being dirty. And so her partner was a nurse and they went out and bought like a gallon of like shampoo and a gallon of cream rinse and one night just showed up and for three hours, anybody that wanted their hair washed got their hair washed. Oh, good morning. It feels good. <laughs> Yay, Young Corbett sits amid protesters singing, Yay for gay children, we shall not be moved. You can't imagine what the 504 said and was like, it was camp. Everything we learned at Crip Camp was what we did there. They blow bubbles and play cards. Jim recounts. So many people from Camp Jeanette, campers, counselors, disabled, non-disabled, found their way into the building. Seen among the participants are Jeanette counselor Sandra Thaler and campers Jan Balter, Nancy D'Angelo, and Valerie Vivona in their wheelchairs. Next, Judy holds a meeting. What we're going to do right now is to read off the list, the names of people who are going to be speaking tomorrow. There were many different Next committees that were working on media and food and medical issues and different things like that. Regulations that we agreed to the January 21st meeting, and he is trying to obscure them. Judy made sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Anyone here who wants to we could not begin a meeting until there was a sign interpreter there. The meetings would go until 3 o'clock in the morning. People have to be engaged and feeling like they made a difference. Otherwise, people weren't going to stay there all that time. As a protester, Dennis leads a song. He speaks to the press. It is revolving into a coalition. The more we talk, the more we discuss, the more we change and regroup, and the more we learn about our own handicap inside of our own coalition, learning sign language, learning Braille, learning about hidden disabilities like epilepsy, arthritis, and learning about all of our disabilities, we would become a tighter and firmer group. Supporters picket outside. News report. The demonstration here is now on its fourth day. It is by far the largest and longest protest ever organized by disabled people in this area. But the problem is still the same as it was on Tuesday, trying to get the attention of Washington. Approaching day seven, people massage each other. Jim. I'm amazed at how many people stayed and what these people had to endure not having a backup ventilator, not having your usual personal care attendant, not having access to catheters. It's hard enough for me to take care of my body. Here we're talking about quadriplegics who can't turn themselves during the middle of the night to prevent body sores and to be sleeping on the floor. I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. Corbett. It's like the world always wants us dead. Disabled people know that every day of our lives. The world doesn't want us around and wants us dead. We live with that reality, so there's always going to be, uh, am I going to survive? Am I going to push back? Am I going to fight to be here? That, that's always true. So if you want to call that anger, I call it kind of drive. You know, you have to be willing to thrive or you're not going to make it. Margaret Irvine. I can work. My mind functions. My hands function. Many of us can work. That's all we're saying. Remove the architectural barriers. Judy recounts. For a number of days, a number of us went on a hunger strike. We were drinking like two or three glasses of liquid a day. Participants drink canned juice from plastic cups. Holland recounts. I know the pressure on Judy had to be very harsh. It's a lot of responsibility. And it was Judy who was saying often, one individual at a time, can you stay? Can you stay just one more day? Can you stay one more day? And that's how they did it, day by day. Reporter Evan White, news broadcast. This building has been occupied for 11 days by a small army of the handicapped. Support outside has increased each day. The sounds of that support carry inside to the offices of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. He recounts. I was at Channel 7, which was on Golden Gate Avenue and just around the corner from the federal building. Local media damn near ignored the entire event. And I was virtually the only one covering it the entire time. Corbett recounts. Evan White essentially embedded with us. 
He did footage of us from beginning to end. I had the immense privilege of being allowed to sit in during the nightly sessions of strategy. I was in heaven on that kind of story. I just, I like people to make trouble. We were trying to push the agenda forward, and so one of the thoughts was, let's get Congress to come to the building and actually have congressional hearings in the building, because we couldn't leave. Evan reports as Judy meets with congressmen. The handicapped demand that Section 504 of the Civil Rights Act be signed. Today, their demand for actions heard by two congressmen, Philip Burton and George Miller. My statement is one of militancy. My statement is one of support from disabled individuals from around the country. This is the beginning of a civil rights movement, and we are proud that you are here to help us launch the civil rights movement, which is so long overdue. Holland Califano, the director of HEW, sent this poor man named Eidenberg to represent him at this ad hoc hearing held by Congressman Miller and Burton. Eidenberg. Right now, a searching analysis is going on in Washington with all deliberate speed, tackling such diverse questions as should drug addicts and alcoholics be covered? To what extent would every school and hospital in this country re be required to remodel? And he had come in with 20-something changes, including instituting the shameful doctrine of separate but equal. A school district was allowed to designate one school as the school that children with disabilities and students with disabilities could go to. Well, what's that? That's separate but equal. We knew it was Califano's little dog and pony show. He sends this poor guy in to read these words because he's gonna put us back in our place. And then he left the room and Congressman Burton said, oh, no, 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 no. Mr. Eidenberg had locked himself into an office and Burton kicked at the door and finally Eidenberg came out. And Burton dragged Eidenberg back into the room, made him sit at the front table facing everybody in the audience so he could listen to our testimony. Congressman George Miller. Somebody's gonna have to pour concrete, somebody's gonna have to knock down some walls, and somebody's gonna have to make school teachers available and classrooms available. But that is the price that we've set that we've been willing to pay for 200 years to make people accessible to the mainstream. Whether there was a sec Section 504, there was a Brown versus Board of Education. Addressing Eidenberg and the congressman, Judy struggles to maintain composure. The, the harassment, the um, lack of equity that has been provided for disabled individuals and that now is even being discussed by the administration. It's so intolerable that I can't quite put it into words. I can tell you that every time you raise issues of separate but equal, the outrage of disabled individuals across the country is going to continue. It is going to be ignited. There will be more takeovers of buildings until finally maybe you begin to understand our position. We will no longer allow the government to up oppress disabled individuals. We want the law enforced. We want no more segregation. We will accept no more discussion of segregation. Listening, Eidenberg nods. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. Judy breaks down amid heartfelt applause from supporters. Corbett recounts. There are moments like where history shifts. Judy's interaction with that man is the moment when things shifted for so many people. Holland. What was Califano thinking with this? Well, he was thinking he didn't have to pay attention to us. That was instrumental and making the leaders decide, we've got to go to D.C., we've got to go get in his face. Day 15 News. Today, a delegation of 25 left San Francisco, heading for the nation's capital, where they hope to present their demands directly to the president. We are hopeful that the president will see us. We have gotten a lot of support from organizations within the community who are paying our way to go to Washington. And we are really hopeful that we will come back with success and regulation signed as we want them. At the San Francisco airport, leaving on this journey of determination, Evan White, Channel 7 News scene. Disabled people and supporters arrive at Washington, D.C. airport, Dennis recounts. 
I felt it was important to let them know right off the plane, we were not playing. So I said, well, you know, well, what are we going to do now? They says, well, you know, we can sleep until tomorrow. I says, oh, no, we're not. We're going to go out there and we're going to sit in front of Califano's house and we're going to let him know that this is 504 and we're here. Holland recounts. There was no accessible transportation at the time. So the machinist union very ingeniously rented a U-Haul truck, plastered their sign on the side of it, and that's how we got around in D.C. And we would sit in darkness as we traveled around, and we wouldn't know where we were until we got there, and they opened up the back, and we could see out again. We went straight to Califano's house and held a candlelight vigil outside of it. Reporter Evan White recounts. The cops came immediately, police cars all around, but they saw a bunch of people in wheelchairs and on crutches, and they didn't want to fuck with them. So they didn't. They just parked across the way and watched all night. Protesters, cops, and press outside a stately mansion. That morning, when the sun was up, Judy and Evan White and his cameraman were knocking on Califano's door. And he never came out. And somebody said he took off out the back door. News reports. The first family used the side door today to leave Washington's First Baptist Church. The Carters avoided about 20 handicapped persons demonstrating across the street from the door the president normally uses. In Washington today, more than 100 people marched in front of the White House. But it doesn't look as if Carter will see the demonstrators personally, even though they've traveled there from San Francisco for that very purpose. Day 22. When the group of 22 left, there's still like a ton of us in San Francisco. You know, then the FBI really ratcheted it up. They really like, there was like 3 a.m. fire alarms and these bomb scares. And our only job, and this was like, you know, Judy, our only job was like, you don't leave until I call you. Yes, we won't leave until you call us. <laughs> we were more scared of disappointing Judy Human than we ever were of the FBI or the police department arresting us. People in DC were very stressed. It should have been a big finale, a big climax. It should have made something happen, shook something loose, and it didn't. We didn't know what was gonna happen. Three times that week, we went 36 hours without sleep. The leaders just held strong and said, how can you give up? It has to be done. And if not, now, when? Photos of wheelchair users boarding the transport truck one at a time via the rear lift. Does anybody know where Dennis' cane is? Does anybody know where Dennis's cane is? No smoking inside. It's not supposed to sit on the floor. There's room on the porch for somebody. <laughs> Judy, sing a song. Hey, um, Ellen, is Bob Perkins up there? I think Mickey went for it. Ask him if he wants to ride in here with us. OK. Day 23, protesters rally outside a hotel. Evan arrives and follows Califano to an elevator with microphone and cameraman. against protocol, sir, but I've come 3,000 miles. Could I ask why you did not meet with the demonstrators this week? Well, there's an illegal demonstration going on in San Francisco, and I just uh, don't think it's appropriate to do that. I understand you have agreed to meet with him and cancel that. Is that true? Califano boards the elevator and the doors close. He said he never made such an agreement, this being an illegal contingent of an illegal sit-in. Evan White was ready to send all of his materials back to San Francisco to Channel 7, and there was a technician strike. Evan recounts. ABC stations all over the country were not getting very much news. So the guys at ABC, the strike breakers, put it to every ABC station in the country. Evan White in Washington, D.C. So they started getting a little blowback. People like Joe Califano didn't give a shit if it was on in San Francisco. 
but it's everywhere. Day 24, a view of the Washington skyline covered in haze, then footage of Califano talking with a reporter at a conference room table with documents on it. Holland recounts. Yeah. As it happened without any fanfare, without letting the press know, or we didn't even know, Califano suddenly signed the regulations the way we wanted them. <laughs> Califano. I think that this, this calls for a revolution of attitudes and uh, thinking uh, and activities on behalf of uh, millions of American citizens. Jubilant protesters and supporters share heartfelt hugs. News reports. When it was over, Dusty Irvine shared bread with her friends. She had been on a hunger strike. This was the first food she had eaten in 23 days. An interpreter signs while Judy speaks with a reporter. In Washington, spokesmen for the handicapped were pleased. Um, the Congress, the press, the American public has seen that we have stamina, strength, intelligence, um, as anyone else does. That disabled individuals, because they're disabled, are not by definition sick. The new laws say every handicapped child in the country has a right to be educated in public schools, something the handicapped have been waiting for for a long time. Dennis. It should have been implemented 20 years ago. <laughs> Are you happy, though, or apprehensive, or what? Uh, I'm very happy. Yes, this shows that the country is waking up, finally, after all the pressure and after all the agonizing and after the humiliating treatment. People were treated in Washington, D.C. and in San Francisco. Spectators applaud sit-in participants as they exit the building triumphantly. Corbett recounts. We literally believed we could beat the U.S. government. Not only did we believe it, but we fucking did it. You know? I mean, we did it, and it's like... And we did it together. And what the 504 sit-in did is it took all these people, deaf people and people with intellectual disabilities and learning disabilities and blind people. I mean, there was this really wide range of people. And we were all going, well, I never heard that story before, but I believe you that that's your experience of being locked up in a mental ward. I believe you that that's your experience in special ed. I believe you. We were witnessing each other's truths. The sit-in participants parade past applauding spectators and the press. We were giving each other, like, I see you and I believe you. Wheelchair users transport belongings piled high on their laps. Others tote backpacks and placards. I didn't have a lot of self-esteem when I became disabled, so you can see why. <laughs> She holds back tears. When 504 told me I had value, it hit home. Steve wheels amid the crowd, headed towards the dome of San Francisco City Hall. Anne recounts. I felt very, very proud to be part of this community. Very proud. Kitty Cone. Wearing a cap and gown, young Jim wheels amid college graduates on campus. He waves and proudly holds up his diploma. Next, the Berkeley Repertory Theater marquee. Jim recounts. A year after the 504 sit-in, I graduated college. I finally got to join my Camp Jeanette friends up in Berkeley. I had gotten my dream job as the resident sound designer at the Berkeley Repertory Theater. But the first two years I worked there, there was no wheelchair access to the sound booth. There were these outdoor steps I had to climb. By the end of winter, there were like mushrooms growing out of the carpet. But because of the regulations being signed, the physical world around me began to become more accessible. 1980 TV report. 
funding from Section 504 has led to sweeping changes in transportation, health care, education, and job opportunities. Universities must now make their buildings and facilities accessible to the disabled and provide interpreters and readers for the deaf and the blind. All housing projects and public buildings using federal money must be made accessible to people in wheelchairs. It's really out in the streets of Berkeley that you see the results of the disabled civil rights movement. Curb ramps designed by wheelchair users allow travel almost anywhere in the city. The implications are enormous. Jim wheels down a ramp. In 1980, Berkeley Rep opened a new, larger theater. He visits the theater office. Because of 504, that new building had to be accessible. In the sound engineer's seat, he connects patch cords and operates audio equipment. As the barriers around me started to disappear, I realized that this bar I had set for myself, that I had to overcome my disability, it had taken a toll on me. It was denying a part of who I am. In the loft control room, he speaks into a headset. 30-something, Judy. I would like to say that um... I'm glad to be here tonight, but, um... Addressing a room full of fellow disabled and otherwise marginalized women, she struggles to hold back tears. Go behind you. Sorry. You know, on the one hand, I'm sitting here feeling like I should say everything is wonderful. And I don't feel, um, that's at all what we talked about. And I'm very tired of being thankful for accessible toilets. <laughs> you know? I, I really am tired of feeling that way when I basically feel that um, if I have to feel thankful about an accessible bathroom, when am I ever going to be equal in the community? No. President Reagan's inaugural address. Then a protest placard reads, Reagan is crippling the disabled. For decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit mortgaging our future and our children's future for the temporary convenience of the present. News report. On May the 7th, Congress was due to vote on budget proposals. The future for disabled programs looked bleak, not only money, but the hard-won legislations at stake. Congressman Miller to no, Judy. It wasn't too long ago, you'd made this trek so we could implement the laws, and now you're here uh, three years later trying to say, uh, don't repeal them. It's, it's, uh... It's amazing how it works in the system. News report. Disabled protesters closed down a street in St. Louis, Missouri on Sunday. It was just a continual struggle to make sure that the 504 regulations were enforced. And on top of that, 504 only covered organizations that were receiving federal money. If you do not stop, you will be arrested. Most public transportation was not accessible. Employers could still discriminate. And private businesses didn't have to do anything at all. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A montage of news coverage of disabled protesters around the country. It is the latest struggle for civil rights and integration into the mainstream of American life. For more than 40 million Americans who are physically or mentally disabled, a new era is dawning. A bill nearing passage in Congress would mandate equal access for the disabled to employment, transportation, and public places. This legislation is a bill of rights for the disabled and America will be a better and fairer nation because of it. Senator Edward Kennedy. Next, the Capitol crawl, March 12, 1990. Children are seen participating in the protest. What do we want? What do we want? Protesters parade to the Capitol building, then many crawl and drag themselves up the 78 concrete steps. A black man in a tweed suit and bow tie winces as he ascends on backside and hands. I'll take a, mic. a blonde girl crawls up arduously on her belly. Others drag a wheelchair or crutches with them. An able bodied woman supports and pushes a struggling crawler. Judy addresses senators. We as disabled persons are here today to ensure for the class of disabled Americans the ordinary daily life that non-disabled Americans too often take for granted. The right to ride a bus or a train, the right to any job for which we are qualified, the right to enter any theater, restaurant, or public accommodation. The passage of this monumental legislation will make it clear that our government will no longer allow the largest minority group in the United States to be denied equal opportunity. 
To do any less is immoral. News report. This morning, Senator Tom Harkin, whose brother is deaf, delivered a speech in sign language, urging passage of this bill. But in the end, it was the disabled themselves who made it happen. President Bush Sr. at an outdoor ceremony July 26, 1990. Let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. God bless you all. On the outdoor stage, flanked by two men in wheelchairs, Bush signs a document and receives an ovation. Next, seniors Denise and Neil wheel into a cafe in motorized chairs. Subtitles appear as Denise recounts. The ADA was, the ADA a, was a wonderful achievement. But it was only a tiny tip of the iceberg. Now they wheel their power chairs through a charming upscale neighborhood. You can pass a law, but until you change society's attitude, that law won't mean much. Now an aerial view of mountains blanketed in the green, yellow, and crimson hues of a vast forest in autumn. Mature Jim gazes out the window of a plane. Oh, to live on sugar mountain with the barkers and the colored balloons. You can't be 20 on sugar mountain though you're thinking Black and white footage of camp alternates with color scenes of large outbuildings and parked construction vehicles as current day Jim and Judy tour the site in their power wheelchairs. This whole perimeter was where the bunks were. It's so noisy at the fair, but all your friends are there. Oh my God, they and don't the recognize this at all. And your mother and your dad. Where is the camp? Is it all gone? Sugar Mountain. Words appear. Camp Jeanette started as a camp for the disabled in 1951. It shut down due to financial difficulties after the summer of 1977. Denise arrives by mobility van and wheels around the site with Jim. Coming back to this place as if it was hollowed ground. And you almost kind of want to say, just, you know, thank you. <laughs> I almost want to get out I almost of want to get out of my wheelchair and kiss the fucking, and kiss the dirt. fucking dirt. <laughs> Lionel joins them. A young brunette woman does a happy dance as Lionel hugs Denise. Young Lionel runs to first base, pushing a baseball player in her wheelchair. Then mature Lionel takes in a gravel yard with outstretched arms. This was an open field, grass, and our baseball diamond was here. Could you have ever imagined where we would go. In documentary footage of Denise and Neil as young parents, a joyful toddler rides the back of Neil's wheelchair. The Jacobsons live in Oakland, California. Neil is a bank vice president. Denise is a writer. Give me a kiss. How about about five kisses? All your life, did you want to be a daddy? Yes, always. Even. David is the first person in my whole life that doesn't care about my disability. I'm daddy. I'm his daddy. At the current day Jeanette site, Denise and Jim. If somebody told you you'd be living in Oakland with your wife, and going, and going wherever the hell you want to go, you can 
You could not imagine. No way. The young woman accompanying Denise is Steve Hoffman's daughter. The freedom that this camp provided definitely influenced the rest of my dad's life. I mean, him being my dad, I, he didn't really want to expose too much of his rebellious, kind of punk hippie attitude and everything. But to connect with that side of him was just really incredible. Photos show her as a little girl gleefully playing with Steve. Words appear, Steve Hoffman, 1950 to 2017. Denise. If I close my eyes, I can hear, I can hear all the campers. Old footage shows Al wheeling backwards on the forest path. Words appear, Al Levy, 1952 to 1997. Then Nancy Rosenblum beams in her wheelchair. Words appear, Nancy Rosenblum, 1947 to 1995. Denise, I can hear Larry's voice. Larry Allison, 1943 to 2014. Uh, very proud of everybody. There needed to be like a moment in time when the spark started the thing to change. And that's why the Judy humans of the world are so important. Judy, you were a total pain in the ass. But, uh, but I loved you anyway. Interview. Judy, what is the most important that has happened to you within the last 20 years? The most important thing for me has been the creation of the disabled rights movement that I feel we can call an international rights movement. Photos show Judy in culturally mixed gatherings and with school children. Words appear, Judy Human served as special advisor for international disability rights at the U.S. Department of State. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Jorge, a disability rights activist from Mexico. Back to the present day Gen Ed site. It was always the best way for me to hug Nancy. Jim scooches forward in his wheelchair seat and hugs Judy. Nancy D'Angelo at camp. <laughs> Larry's head falls back with riotous laughter. Smiling joyfully, cuddled together, Jim and Nancy wave. Words appear, Nancy D'Angelo, 1953 to 1988. A smiling camp boy makes the peace sign. Credits. Audio description by Descriptive Video Works. In order of appearance, Jim Lebrecht, Lionel J. Woodyard, Joseph O'Connor, Anne Capolo Freeman, Denise Shearer Jacobson, Judith Human, Neil Jacobson, Sheldon Coy, Dr. William Bronston, Corbett O'Toole, Holland DeLille, Dennis Billups, Evan White. Featuring archival footage filmed at Camp Jeanette by the People's Video Theater, 1970 to 72. Howard Gutstedt and Ben Levine, and Molly Hughes, Richard Malone, Ken Marsh, Elaine Maloche, and Elliot Glass. Music supervisor, Amin Raymer. Original music by Bear McCrary. Edited by Eileen Meyer and Andrew Gersh. Co-editor, Mary Lampson. Additional executive producers, Tonya Davis and Priya Swaminathan. Howard Gertler, Josh Braun, Ben Braun, Matt Burke, Ray Livshay, Jonathan Logan, and Patty Quillen. Produced by Sarah Boulder, Jim Lebrecht, and Nicole Noonan. Associate producer, Lauren Schwartzman. Story consultant, Denise Shearer Jacobson. Additional editor, Shane Hofelt. Director of photography, Justin Shane.
produced in association with Fork Films and the Center for Independent Documentary. This project was made possible with support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Visit www.calhum.org. Crip Camp has been made possible in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities with the support of Independent Film Project, supported by Sundance Institute Catalyst. Crip Camp, copyright 2020, Rusted Spoke Productions, LLC. All rights reserved.